So just a little bit of background, you may know about this already. A6Y is very common, one in 500 um, birth, or about eight to nine birth per day. It's more common than um, some of the syndromes we often hear about, like Down syndrome, Fragile X, and Turner syndrome. Um, but it's not, often not diagnosed. This was a study done in the span of four years to see when a boy with XXY was diagnosed. So the majority, the highlight here is 64% are undiagnosed. They will go through their lifetime time not knowing that they have XXY diagnosis. Let's look at the 26% that were diagnosed postnatally to see when they were diagnosed. So the majority were diagnosed after the age of 10. Mostly they were diagnosed over the age of 20 years. So there's an issue here with XXY diagnosis. Most will not be diagnosed. Those that are being diagnosed are being diagnosed late in life. This was a study that we did recently, which is published this year, to see when parents became concerned with their child's development and when they received the diagnosis of XXY. And we divided the, two, the groups into two groups. The first group, the parents um, would express developmental concerns, such as speech delay, delay in walking, or hypotonia. And it was a wide range. The range was between two months to 20 years of age, um, with the mean age of about five years. But they received the diagnosis of XXY at 10 years. So there's a gap of about five years when parents learn that their child has XXY. And then the second book was um, the, the endocrinologic issues, such as physical changes, like some parents were concerned that their son had small testes, or they were tall, they had lack of facial hair, chest hair, and the first concern was about at about 19 years of age, and they got the diagnosis at 21 years of age. So the gap is about two years. So what this means is doctors often do not associate developmental issues with XXY, but they do the test, the chromosome testing quicker, quickly when there's physical changes. So as I mentioned, XXY is common, but um, they're not often diagnosed because there's no dysmorphic characteristics about them at all. Their range of development is usually within normal. They may have mild speech delay, mild delay in walking, but it's still within the normal range. So chromosome is not typically done. So now we're gonna move on to the talk on development and behavior. So before I go on to the actual talk, I just want you to remind you what is developmental milestones. Um, in terms of developmental milestones, the range is, of normal is wide. For example, um, sitting. The average age of sitting for a typical child is six months of age, but the normal range is four to nine months. So a child with XXY, they may fall within the range and con still consider normal, and they may not qualify for services like physical therapy. And um, so it's important for parents to know the expected range and make sure that your child is making progress, but not just achieving the milestones, but making sure they're doing correctly. So when they're walking, they're not walking with a wide gait. When they're talking, they're talking, their speech is clear to strangers, to their peers. And beyond speech delay, they should be able to talk socially with, with, um, in a social setting, pragmatics. So sometimes when a child with XXY, when they grow up, speech therapy is discontinued because they're able to talk, but they still can talk in a social setting. So it's important that they continue speech therapy, but you just tweak it a little bit and focus on pragmatics. So as I mentioned, um, the range of development is why, and we'll talk more about that, but it's important that they, um, your child has um, effective therapies, practical teaching strategies, and you have to balance your needs with your child needs too. So don't feel like he should be getting therapy every single day, because that's gonna stress you out, it's gonna stress your child out. And sometimes your child may not qualify for services because um, he's within the normal range, but maybe on the lower end. But um, the therapist should still come and, and look at your child on a, um, once a month or once every three months. And you can ask for a home-based program. You can get private therapy if the school doesn't offer therapy for them. And you can do different strategies, um, like getting swimming therapy instead of physical therapy, join some social setting, um, to help with social skills if he's, not get, um, if he's not getting social skills training. And I want to emphasize that the whole point of therapy is not to catch up. Um, you know, if your child is getting physical therapy, it's going to help him with walking, he's going to make progress, but the main point of therapy is to make sure he does it correctly. Okay, so um, it's not to catch up 
and um, to speed up the process. Because sometimes when you speed up the process, you may not do it correctly. So the focus is on doing correctly and on long-term functioning. And quality is more important than quantity. And sometimes it's okay to take a break from therapies if you're feeling stressed out, if your child is stressed out. Um, and the therapists provide guidance, and then you know you should talk to the therapist. Make sure you ask for a home practice program, daily practice, and doing it um, throughout the day, and teaching your child the correct way early because that's going to help with long-term functioning. Okay, so now we're going to focus on development. First, I'm going to talk about typical development, and then we're going to compare that to XXY development. Okay, so when we talk about development, we look at four things: gross motor is your big muscle for walking and running. Fine motor is what you can do, is your small muscle, what you can do with your hand, like handwriting, buttoning your shirt, dressing yourself. Language is divided to expressive and receptive, and then social skills. The two areas that most of the boys with XXY have problems in, or challenges in, are language and social skills. So first is gross motor, big muscle, okay? And your gross motor improves from head to toe. Any child, typical child, um, any child. First, your child will develop head control, then he can roll over. Trunk control, then he can sit. Hip control, crawling, leg control, walking. So top to bottom, okay? <clears throat> so this is a newborn. A newborn doesn't do much. They're so cute. They just cry and poop, right, and eat. They're not doing much at all. But when you look at a newborn, um, in terms of gross motor, they're just, they have reflex. You know, when you pick them up, you put, and, and you let them go down, they just have reflex. That's all they do. There's not much going on. It'd be, it would be great to have Susan's baby in here so I can show you. She's two months old. And um, when you, this is a newborn. When they're on their tummy, they're just sleeping. At two months of age, they slowly lift up their head. Okay? And then at four months, they should have perfect head control. Once they have a perfect head control like this, they can roll over back to front and front to back. Because you can't roll over without good head control because your head won't go, right? And then when they're on their back, at two months they still have head lag. And then at four months, when they have good head control, you pull them up, their head shouldn't lag anymore. And when you hold them up, a newborn will be sort of like a V shape because they have no muscle control at all. But as they get older, at about two or three months of age, they can extend their legs, they can start extending their arm. So they're developing good muscle control. And then in terms of sitting, um, at one month, two months, it's not much, because they still don't have trunk control. They're still developing hair control. So there's not much hair to in, in a three, four month old. But then once they have good hair control, they can roll over, then, then you focus next on trunk control. Then at six months of age, they're starting to sit now, they're developing trunk control. And this is a six month old who has, who's able to sit independently because he has good trunk control. And next is hip control for crawling. So first they may do creeping, they're not getting up on all four yet. And then, then eventually they'll get on all four and then they'll start to crawl. And you know, crawling happens at about nine months of age for most kids. And then after that is leg control for walking and they'll start off with cruising. Um, cruising means they, ho they hold onto a furniture and start walking with support. And then eventually they'll start walking on their own. And the range is, the average age of walking is 12 months. The range is about nine to 17 months of age. And then um, 18 months they start running, 24 months going up and down the stairs. Three years they can pedal a tricycle and um, kicking ball, hopping, skipping. So I'm just showing you the typical milestones so you have a comparison to um, your son with XXY. So in terms of XXY, um, some boys may have hypotonia or low muscle tone, so they may achieve the gross motor skills at a later time, but some boys may not have any gross motor delay at all, and, um, and it may be influenced by the age of diagnosis. Here's some handout, okay? Let me pass this to the back. She's in the back too. And some of our boys with XXY, even if they don't have gross motor delay, sometimes when they're, when they're walking, they may be awkward, they may not be coordinated, and it's because of, of de de decreased tone, strength, and coordination. 
So in the infancy period, um, boys with XXY may have hypotonia, so they may walk, um, um, oh, so here, so most will walk by 12 months with, with therapy, but some will walk at about 18 months of age. And at this point, their height is normal. And then during childhood, they're, they're starting to get tall. And you know, the tallness happens because of long legs, and that happens in about five to eight years of age. And at this time, you may see they're becoming clumsy or awkward. So that's why it's important to build strength, tone, and coordination. So even if they're not getting physical therapy, they should be getting maybe swimming therapy, um, gymnastic, horseback riding to help with tone, strength, and coordination. And as they get older in their teen, their upper trunk um, the, is going to be less than their lower trunk because the legs are so long. And they will also have an increasing arm span, the shoulders narrow, the hips is wide. So it's so important to build muscle strength at a young age so that when they get tall, they're not awkward and clumsy when they, when, in their adolescence. And as I mentioned, um, the height increase happens um, at about five to eight years of age. So keep a close eye on your son uh, when they're at this age, okay? And they're usually about six feet. And they're, boys with XYY are taller. They're about six feet three. Um, but they will be about five inches taller than their father. Some boys with XXY will also have flat feet. And usually there's no treatment for this unless it's very severe. And um, I just had a patient who has XYY who has flat feet, but it causes him a lot of pain when he's walking, so he's gonna have surgery so that he can have an arch on his feet. And so if your child has delayed gross motor development, he should be getting physical therapy. But if he's not delayed in terms of gross motor, but if he's having poor tone, coordination or strength, and, or he's awkward, he should be getting um, some sort of sport therapy like swimming, um, horseback riding. And if he's having difficulties keeping up with his peers in sport activities, um, you may want to seek non-sport activities for your son to be involved in to gain his self-confidence. We just don't want our boys with XXY to lose their self-confidence if they can't keep up with their peers. Okay, if you have any questions, just let me know. Does anyone have questions with gross motor before we move on to fine motor? Okay, yes, uh -huh. Yeah, I just do have a question. When you, I'm just wondering if the pronation has anything to do with, uh, my son is four and a half and I still can't get him to really ride a tricycle. Yeah. But other things, he seems to, like skipping, he seems to be doing okay. So I'm just wondering. Yeah, like, that's. What, that's common with boys with XXY because of the poor tone coordination and swing. So even if they can reach the pedal on the tricycle, they have a, they just can't coordinate it. Um, is that what he's having? Yeah. yeah, it's a coordination. So you should build strength in the lower extremities. Sometimes um, I tell my patients to have their kids walk on surfaces that's uneven, like sand, you know, like um, build a sandbox or grass or mattress, but of course, you know, not high mattress, so he's not falling. The uneven, well, walking on an, an, an surfaces that's not even will build tone and strength on the lower extremity. Mm -hmm. And swimming will help too. Swimming will help. And um, a fine motor is your hand, okay, hand eye coordination. And this improves from proximal to distal. So from shoulder to all the way to the fingertips, okay? So in a new, again, I'm gonna go over typical development first. In a newborn, um, there's not much going on again. Um, they just have this fencing re reflex because they're unable to fo follow past the midline. So you have a newborn, you give them an object, they can only really follow up to here, just midline. Because of this, they have the fencing re reflex. And then if you bring an object from this side, then they turn around and then the hand changes also. At about two months of age, they can follow past midline. So you bring an object, they can go all the way like that, all the way. Then the fencing re re reflex disappear, then they can turn their head now all the way. And then their hands start to come together at midline, okay? And, and so when their hand comes together at midline, this is when you're having fun with them. They may be starting to reach out for the toys when you give to them, they may be reaching out for your hair, so they're starting to explore um, toys. And we're actually doing a, a clinical trial, not in boys with XXY, in, in 
infants with Down syndrome, and I think the same problems with, it happens with boys with XXY. In infants with Down syndrome, it takes them a long time to open their hands, so it takes them a while to put, bring toys to their face, and that delay their learning. Um, because in typical children, it happens at about three to four months of age. So because um, kids with Down syndrome, and also maybe XXY, it takes them a long time. So we're doing, we're creating a mitten, a, a small mitten that we're putting in the child's hand, which has a Velcro. And we're going, uh, we have toys, blocks that has Velcro. So the child will put the mitten, the sticky mitten that has the Velcro to the toy. The toy will stick to their hand and they can explore the toy quickly. And that will help them with their learning and uh, development um, sooner than later. So um, midnight play happens at about four months of age. They're reaching out for objects, bring objects to mouth. And then at six months, they're gonna be transferring objects. So you give them an object to hold, they can transfer from one hand to the next, but they're unable to hold onto two objects. If you give them, if they hold onto one object, let's say on the right hand here, you give them an object on the left hand, they'll drop this object. Because at the six months, they can only focus on one object. And then at about eight months of age, they can focus on two objects, like this child here. Once the child can focus on two objects, they'll bang the toys together. They'll bring the toys and bang them together. And at this point, you focus on finger movement. So you may give them a small object, like a raisin, and then initially what they're gonna do is just raking, just raking objects with all, with four fingers. They're not using their thumb yet. Then eventually at about nine months of age, they'll pick up small objects with their thumb and um, their finger. And then eventually they'll have the most important um, milestone is the pincer grasp, where they're using two fingers to pick up small objects like this. Once your child develops this milestone, then you can focus more on hand-eye skills, like building blocks, like, like building blocks, um, tower of two, tower of three, four, um, holding onto a spoon so they can learn how to feed themselves, drinking from a sippy cup, and then eventually they can copy circles, um, drawing pictures, um, tying shoes, and all that is um, typical development. So now let's look at a boy with XXY. We'll look at some of the medical issues that may impact some of those skills. So some boys with XXY, um, this is a normal X-ray. You see the two bone here, the radius and ulnar, it's widely spaced. In some boys with XXY, these two bones are fused together. When that happens, they have a hard time with pronating the movement of their arm. So, um, so that can impact the way they use their hand, like handwriting, um, any like buttoning their shirt, tying the shoes, it can slow them down. So the school needs to be aware of this because um, it may take them a, a while to complete the classwork assignment. And it's also important for them to get occupational therapy for this. Okay, so if you're concerned that your child has a hard time, like this child here, he's extend, oh, sorry. He's extending his arm, this arm is fine, it's extended, but this one, is, you see the curve here? If your child has this, I would consider getting an x-ray, okay? There's no treatment for this per se, but there's therapies that, um, like occupational therapy your child can get, but I think the most important thing is the school needs to be aware of that, so your child can have extra time to complete assignment. And then, um, so I mentioned occupational therapy, and to help with handwriting, there's some great programs like the Handwriting Without Tears, computers, you know, the iPad is great. Um, and using practical teaching strategies, um, teach, um, tying shoes, buttoning, and then informing school to have your child have extra time to complete classwork assignment. And handwriting without tears, because um, it shows you step by steps how, how to um, write numbers. So write a website there. And they also have a special pencil too um, that's very heavy, because sometimes or boys with XXY, they just don't, they're not coordinated and they don't get a good grip of the pencil. So the website, um, they also sell pencil for, um, um, for boys who have, deep, who have low t um, tone. Okay, so next is language, which is the most important milestone for all boys with XXY, because we know that the majority of boys with XXY will have speech delay. So again, we'll go over the typical development and um, when we talk about language, it's divided into receptive and expressive. Almost all boys with XXY are advanced in receptive compared to expressive. Re receptive means the understanding. They understand a lot. There's a lot they want to say, but they can't get it out. So the expressive is always behind. So um, in terms of receptive, in a newborn or one month old, 
they're just looking at your face, you know, and express if they cry. That's their way of talking. And then at two months, they start cooing, ooh, ah. Mm -hmm. And at six months, they start babbling, da da da, mama, mama. Okay, and, and most of the boys with XXY, they do babble at about six months. They follow a typical pattern, but it's the transitioning from babbling to words, which takes them a long time. A typical boy will usually say, dada, mama, at about 12, month, 12 months of age. But a boy with XXY, sometimes it takes them longer. It may be at about 16 to 18 months of age, but it's still within the normal range. So the parents may not be concerned, the pediatrician may not be concerned at that time. But it's just a transition from babbling to words that takes a long time, and that should be the first sign that they're, um, that they're gonna have speech delay, or they're at risk for speech delay. And then um, 15 months, they should have about 46 words, 18 months, about 20 words or so. 24 months, they start to have more than 50 words, and they can put two words together. Like come here, um, want more, and then at three years of age, more than 250 words, and they're using pronouns, future tenses now. And this is when the gap gets wider with t um, between typical boys and boys with XXY, okay? And four years, um, complete sentences. And then in, also beyond that, um, in terms of speech, we also wanna make sure that the speech is clear, not just to parents, but to um, strangers, um, teachers, and peers. By two years of age, the speech should be clear, about 50%. At four years, about 100%. And that sometimes doesn't happen with boys with XXY. Receptive, um, this is the area that boys with XXY don't have a lot of issues in. And, um, you know, just gonna, so at about 18 months, they should know at least, they, they should un understand at least 50 words, they should know their body parts, and points to at least two pictures. At two at years, they should follow two two step command: go get your shoes and bring it here. Um, points to name pictures. Three years, they should know their first and last name. At four years, they should know the opposite, like big and small, tall and short. They should be able to tell stories. Okay, so in our boys with XXY, um, speech delay is quite obvious by 12 months of age, and. Um, and first words is usually spoken at about 18 to 24 months of age. And by 24 months of age, there's a big gap between expressive and receptive. So your child may get the diagnosis of a apraxia. Does any of your son have that diagnosis as well? Mm -hmm. Apraxia, so that basically means the gap between expressive and receptive. And then um, in the preschool years, they're shy when the language demand is high, like in um, circle time or in group setting. And some of the men with XXY usually tell us that there's a typical tongue phenomenon. So sometimes they know what they want to say is in here, but it just doesn't connect. It just doesn't come out. And um, it's more difficult in the social setting and, or, when it's being, or when they're being pressured to talk and then they have to make eye contact. But they can talk, but it's just not easy. And then, um, so the consequences of ha having a language delay, it's, it impacts um, IQ is impact academic performance. The verbal IQ is lower than their non-verbal IQ, but the full scale IQ is sometime within the normal range. And 50% of them are at risk for dyslexia, at risk for reading and spelling, and then so in social setting, they may have difficulties, they may be um, withdrawn, they get frustrated, or they may have outburst. So the primary problem is language, speech delay, that's primary. But this leads to um, other problems like short attention span, um, social skills problem, the sensory problem, anxiety, depression, mood disorder. So because primary problem is language deficits, so we have to provide therapy for that so that it decreases your, your child's risk of having all these behavior problems, okay? And then also studies have shown that the deficits in the language delay, the early childhood, continues on in as they get older. And most of the patients that were in this studies were diagnosed late in life, but I think it's important for us to know so that if you have a young child, you can, there's things that you can do now to prevent some of the problems that we're learning from older men. Um, for example, some of, some of the problems are that um, the social, there's social impairment um, in nonverbal co um, cognitive. So the nonverbal co cognitive is like social cue. They have a hard time in social setting in reading social cue when it's time for them to talk, 
when it's time for them not to talk. Yes, Emma? I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. In this subject of the social cues, earlier on when you talked about the early development and three months, et cetera, I did notice that my son, even if he was really little, didn't do, not only now does he not really read the social cues, but I also noticed that he can do like the expressive, like, oh, I'm excited or something. So I'm just, I guess my question Yes. Yes. I'm going to talk about all of that. Okay. Oh. I'm going to talk about um, treatment specific, starting from a young age, being proactive now, so that um, we can decrease or prevent some of the problems that we're seeing in um, men with XXY. Okay. And and so um, what we also learned from this study is that the younger group, when they have language deficits, they have more attention problems. But when they get older, the attention problem seems to go away. But there was impairment in language and motor function, but mostly social functioning. So speech therapy is important, but then sometimes um, your child won't be able to get speech therapy because the school will tell you he's talking. So you have to make sure the IEP focuses on pragmatic, on social speech, um, how he's talking with his friends, how he's interacting in the social environment, which is completely different from a child with, let's say, Down syndrome who has speech delay and they're just learning how to get more words. A child with XXY may have enough words for his age but he's just not doing it correctly. So it's important to have um, to focus on the, the pragmatics. And social skills training is important too. Sometimes the school doesn't provide this because it's not an academic diagnosis. So you may have to look for private social skills training for your son. And then, um, and I think it's important to, for the school to know, um, for example, um, practical teaching strategies. Have your child sit in front of the class instead of in the back. If he's in the back, it, might, it may cause him to be more anxious because he can see all of his classmates. And um, at, at a young age, um, having him have a lot of play dates with his peers, helping him at a young age on um, creating friendship and building self-confidence, because that will be important as your child gets older. And then, so now we're gonna focus on more on language development. Even if you have a young child who's not talking yet, let's say he's less than a year old, you can still do speech therapy, or working on pre-speech. I, know, I talked about big muscle, like walking and running, and some of the boys with XXY have hypotonia or low, low muscle tone. But we also can't forget about the small muscle, which, which is our facial muscle. And sometimes boys with XXY have um, decreased um, skills when they're talking. And if your child has feeding problems in an early age, that's probably a sign of um, low skills in terms of the, the, the coordination of tongue, mouth, and, um, and jaw, okay? So the way to practice that, to improve tone strength and coordination, is to go to this website, talktoons.net. They have some um, toys that's not expensive that you can teach your child how to blow bubbles, looking at the, the mirror when they're talking, sipping from a straw. That will prepare them for talking. And then before your child talk, um, you know, the speech therapy should focus on total communication because we want to decrease frustration. If your child is unable to say something, at least he can sign the word. So using sign language is very good. Um, using gestures and pointing. And then eventually, once your child starts talking, he'll stop using the sign words. But it's just to decrease frustration and prevent behavior problems. So in terms of verbal, um, reading books to your child, singing, play groups will be excellent way of teaching him how to talk. And then using pictures. It's, um, the pictures, if he's unable to say something, we just don't want him to be grunting or um, screaming. So using, using pictures, so he can point to pictures. And you can use pictures like this. I like pictures where it has words also, so you, you can teach your young child sight reading at the same time. Because um, boys with XXY, they're visual learner. When we talk to men with XXY, they often tell us that they remember better with pictures and words. That they just can't get the words out. So I think if you want to use um, pictures, it should have it should have words so that um, they're learning how to sight read. Dog. I have one child in my clinic. He's three years old now. So the mom started um, on the sight reading since he was 15 months. So now when he sees the word "touch your head," he's not saying it. He's not reading it. When he sees the word "touch your head," he touches his head. So he's learning to talk, but at the same time, he's learning sight reading. So you're killing two birds with one. 
And then next is social skills, which we initially thought wasn't a problem with boys with XXY because we thought they were shy, quiet, withdrawn. So they're the perfect child, the good child, easy going child. But it does become a problem when they get older, when they won't have you to help them anymore, when they're on their own, it becomes a problem. So I think we also, beyond language, we also have to emphasize on social skills functioning, okay? So um, I'm gonna go over typical social skills again. Um, six weeks of age, you, the typical child will start to smile. Two months, they're looking at your face. They smile at you, you smile at them, regarding face. Four months, they start to laugh. Six months, they know who you are. They may cry when they're, when they're with strangers. And nine months, they start to play peekaboo. Um, Say, you know, they may wave bye bye. And in 12 months, they're interested in books and, you know, different toys now. And two years, terrible two, two years, they're starting to play with their friends, taking turns. At four years, this is the critical age. Four years, they prefer to play with their friends. This sometimes doesn't happen with our boys with XXY. Um, this is when they, you know, start preschool at about three, four years of age. And then at two, three years of age, they're just the easy child, the perfect child in, 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 in preschool. And then four years, the typical child will start to want to play with their friends. They may even ask you, oh, can, can Anna come to my house and play? But that sometimes doesn't happen with boys with XXY. So this is very important that you keep this in mind. Four years, your child should prefer to play with his friends and be asking about his friends and be telling stories about his friends. And if this doesn't happen, you should prompt. When he comes home from school, you should ask him, so how was your day? Um, and then if he say good, then you should go on from there. So did, did um, Bobby play with you? Did Bobby, was Bobby in school? Just start asking questions. Your home should be, you know, at your house, you, you should be talking a lot to your son with XXY. Even if he's quiet, you should be talking always in his face. And then some of the therapies that's not so much considered traditional therapy, they're also important, um, like aqua therapy, um, which is physical therapy in the swimming pool. And it's important for social skills. And sometimes when a child is in the swimming pool, it's less stress for them. They're not forced to make eye contact or talk to anyone. So they're happy and they may just talk spontaneously. But I think what's important is that being in the swimming pool, you know, doing swimming, it also helps with trunk control. Because some of the boys with XXY, we know they have low muscle tone. And sometimes when they get sick, let's say they have an upper respiratory infection, it may lead to more complications because they just don't have good in endurance. Like the inhaling, exhaling, they can't do it as well as a typical boy. So I think swimming is great. Um, if, and if you can't do aqua therapy, you can do swimming therapy for your son. I'm um, not, not sorry, I'm sorry, not swimming therapy, swimming lesson. Hypotherapy is also good. That's physical therapy or occupational therapy on a horse. Again, it's less stress, they're not forced to make eye contact, so they, they tend to talk more and they get very excited. And so after the hypotherapy, some of the kids are just so happy to talk about the horse that they were just riding on. And um, mu the, the music therapy is also good because the focus is not just on singing, and it's playing instruments, so hand-eye coordination, playing with the guitar, playing with um, different things, and, and the kids have fun. And I think for our boys with XXY, it's gonna help them with tone. Sometimes when a boy with XXY, when they talk, they whisper. You can't hear them. So, but when they're singing, they do such a great job. So this will build their self-confidence. With boys with XXY, I always with my parents, um, the parents that come to our clinic, think about language, think about social skills, and self-confidence. Those are the three important things, the three key things that will help them when they get older. It's because um, there's so many things you have to worry about, right? So you just have to focus on the top three things. And then, you know, so sometimes you're not sure what is the right therapy. Do we get therapy on a daily basis? Well, it's impossible to get therapy every day because everyone's going to be stressed out. So it's important to use every moment as teaching moments um, so that you're not it's not like you're doing therapy. I mean, like for example, when you're getting, when your child's getting dressed, you can teach him color. So you can tell him, do you, um, you can ask your son, um, there's a red shirt and there's a blue shirt. Which one do you want to wear? You can teach him color. Even when he's eating snack, you know, those little um, gold fish, you, you can teach him color at the same time. When they're playing with their dogs and cats, you, you can tell them, go take the dog for a run. So that will help build their muscle tone and strength. Um, 
when they're at the beach, they're walking on the sand, that would help them to playing sports, um, book reading. When they're going to the bathroom, you know, using different moments as teaching moments, just being creative, and even watching TV is okay, um, as long as it's not two, more, more than two hours a day. And ch children learn best by playing. Um, the first two years of life is the most critical because their brain is still developing. But playing is the best way for any child to learn. And you, know, you start playing with your, your child from the time they're born. And using toys as um, teaching instruments. When you're playing with your child, you want to explain to them what, what does a toy do, um, you know, what color it is. And, um, and then being in front of your child's face. So sometimes when you play with your child, sometimes parents get in the back. You know, it's important to be in front of your, your child's face. Because we know that boys with XXY, they tend to be shy. They tend not to make eye contact. So it's important that in early play, you're always in their, you know, not always, as much as possible, you're in front of their face and you're teaching them play skills and also social skills. And then sometimes structured teaching is good because some boys with XXY, they like structure, they like routine, they just don't like changes and transition. So you have to see uh, your child's personality, what he learns best. They, might, they may like structured learning, like doing the same thing every day with we're gonna read right after um, dinner time. So it just depends how your child learn. And sometimes um, structured teaching can be when the child is eating, you, you know, when they're learning how to drink from a sippy cup, um, when, when, you're, when they're learning how, how to use a spoon. But I think what's important is that sometimes children with Down, with, just not down syndrome, with, fra with, with fragile X, oh my gosh, those are the, with XXY, um, they do everything, but they may not do it correctly. So, um, for example, with feeding themselves, you know, you, you, when they're using a spoon, they may make a big mess and they're four years old. And their classmates are doing a good job. So it's important that you provide prompting. This is how we hold a spoon and this is how you do it. Teaching your child step by step, okay? So it's not just doing it, but it's doing correctly. And I think some of the, the older boys with XXY that we need, what they tell us is that when they were growing up, they felt awkward. They were able to do the same thing as their peers, but not do it correctly, so they stopped doing it. So they lack the self-confidence. So I think at a very young age, you need to make sure your child is doing correctly. It may not be perfectly, but correctly as much as possible. So he, he fits in with his peers. And, um, and practice, practice different settings. Because he may do it correct at home, but he may not do it correctly when you're out in a social setting, like at a restaurant or at school. Practice in different places. So, um, so increasing the skills by practicing, and I mentioned that before, and practicing in different places. And then praise your child and, um, by saying, you are so smart, that is so good. And you know, try not to say no so much. You know, if your child does something um, that's wrong, don't say no, because you want to use, you know, save that word no for when a child truly has behavior problems. So when he's not doing something correctly, when you're teaching him developmental skills, just say, try again. And then when he does it correctly, you know, say, that's great, you are so smart. This is teaching him self-confidence. And you're teaching him at an early age, not when the problem starts. So you're being proactive now, pro proactive now to prevent long-term problems or to decrease um, the long-term problems that we know about men with XXY. Sensory problems also, um, it's common in boys with XXY. We have five senses, seeing, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. And sometimes boys with XXY may be overstimulated or understimulated. So sometimes they may be picky eater, or sometimes when they go to birthday party, they may not like loud noises. They may cover their ears. And um, and you know, these are some of the symptoms when they have sensory issues. They may be they may not like being touched. They may not like their hair being washed or um, not like their teeth being brushed. So it's important that you you're aware if your child has sensory issues and they should be getting sensory therapy. Okay, because with sensory problems, sometimes it leads to behavior problems, and then they may get misdiagnosed as having behavior problems when truly their problems is sensory issues. Okay. Next is behavior. Um, so there's been lots of studies on behaviors of boys with XXY, and it just depends on when they were diagnosed. Um, some of the, the, the studies show that they're friendly, they relate well to people, they function well in a social environment. Some say that they're very timid, they're immature for their age, they have poor, poor, poor relationship with their peers. Some 
say that they're at risk for anxiety, depression, substance abuse. It just varies. It's, it varies, but I think it's important for us to know so that um, if you have a young child, there may be things that you could do now to prevent some of those problems. Some of the new studies are coming out, and it shows that in adulthood, they have social issues. That's, they have less engagement in social functioning. They have difficulties with expressing their needs and wants, so when they're with their peers, they may not speak up. Um, so they're very quiet. And a study in 2009 showed, it was a small study, showed that 27% are at risk for autism, but again, it's when they receive the diagnosis and what therapy they get. So you have a young child, you have the opportunity to know more about XXY and to get the correct therapy for your child. And then, um, as I mentioned before, some of the boys, the men with XXY had dif difficulties um, standing up for themselves, expressing their needs and wants. And, um, and it's just they're, they know what they want to say, but they just don't have the self-confidence to say it. So it becomes a problem in long-term functioning because they don't have their parents to help them anymore. Let me go on this. So this was another study asking the men with XXY themselves what area they rated us the, having the most challenges. And it was five areas that they ranked as having the most um, difficulties. Their well-being, self-confidence, body image, the mental health, and general health. They were concerned about all of that. And, um, and also, the age of diagnosis were not predictor of these issues. It was more, the men that had better psycho, um, social outcome were those who had a, a full-time job, those who had social support, those who had a lot of friends and family, that supported them, and those who had um, physical features in terms of those who were skinny and had better outcome than those who were obese. Okay, so to keep that in mind too. And that's in general too, I think, you know, in the general population. And I think the main message here is self-confidence, self-confidence. So you want to build self-confidence for your child at an early age. The men here that reported problems that had low self-confidence um, didn't have, didn't have um, the opportunity to have social skills training when they were young, to uh, understand their condition when they were younger. So for your young child, you know, you want to enhance their self-confidence. So social skills training, you want to do social stories. You know, when you're talking to your child, um, do social stories. What that means is you, you can tell him, give him examples of social situation that he's going to be in, and then telling him how, asking him how he would react. Like for example, when you go to Bobby's birthday party, what are you going to do? Things like that. So he's prepared when the actual event happened. Okay? And having, make sure he has hobby and interest so that he has something to talk about when he's with his friends. And a few trusted and close friends so, so, that, he has, so that he can um, talk about his best friend. And then it's important for you to teach socially age-appropriate behavior um, at an early age. Sometimes we see 14-year-old boys with XXY who still sits on their parents' lap, and that's not appropriate. Sometimes the parents think it's okay because the boy has XXY, but it's not okay. So you want to teach your, your boys with XXY at an early age. So, uh, for example, a 10-year-old shouldn't sit in a parent's lap in a, in, in a social setting. It may be okay to do it at home, you know, when you're watching TV, but in a social setting, it's not okay. And you want to teach your child appropriate behavior in a private setting versus public setting, like touching themselves and all that. Um, and that's very important. That will build their self-confidence. The more they know what is appropriate to do in a, in a social setting, they'll have more self-confidence. Okay? And don't wait for the school to do any of this because it's not an academic diagnosis. So it comes back to you. It's you that have to do it. Uh -huh. Okay. And sometimes, um, there's medications, you know, it's not the first line of treatment for our boys with XXY, but sometimes when they're very stressed out, you know, they're very anxious in a social setting and there's and nothing helps them. We try social stories, we try social skills training, nothing helps them. We, then we turn to medication, but it's not the first line of treatment, but it's an option. Okay? And we only do this when your child is expressing distress, when they're not um, learning anymore, they just don't want to go to school. I had one child who was complaining of stomach ache um, every day, and it was because he didn't want to go to school. There was nothing wrong with him. He was very anxious to go to school, and we started him on Soloft, and now he's able to go back to school. And 
because we put him on, on soul love, it's not permanent. He's not going to be on it for lifelong. It's just to get him started so he can feel his self-confidence again. Okay, any questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, I just say, you just mentioned the appropriate behavior on mm -hmm. what is acceptable or not, yeah. and I, I had those issues with my son. How old is your son? My son's four and a half. Mm -hmm. but, um, the, but I've noticed that with the iPhone, when I catch him doing something inappropriate, like for example, hugging in public with a stranger or something, yeah. I videotape it, then I model the appropriate way, and then it seems that, oh, I can make it a cue once he sees visually Correct. the iPhone what, what is appropriate yeah. and what is not, and so I thought that that was really yeah. great that you brought that up. So boys with XXY, they learn best by visual, by picture. Not so much by you telling him that, you know, so you tell him, don't hug stranger. He may not remember it, but if he sees picture, it's okay to hug mommy, it's okay to hug daddy, it's not okay to hug stranger, you know, that he may remember it better. And especially at four and a half, he may not understand when you tell him. So um, as I mentioned, language, social skills training, and self-confidence are very important in our boys with XXY. And that would help them long term with academic and also social skill, uh, social functioning, because what we learn from all these studies is that the adults, the men with XXY, you know, when they're not in school anymore, they're just working. They have a hard time fitting in. So we can learn from them, and so that you know, our, then you, you can help your young kids now. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. No, it was fast. <laughs> but if you have any questions, I'm here to answer.